The Montana dueling dinosaurs are two very different dinosaurs. Basically, predator and prey. We have a Tyrannosaurid, uh, Nano Tyrannus lancensis, and, and what we presume is its prey. Uh, a brand new Ceratopsian, a brand new genus and species of Chasmosaurine Ceratopsian. Clayton and his crew are really remarkable. They've never collected something this large before. And here we have two big dinosaurs. We're not talking little tiny things. We're talking something as big or bigger than Triceratops and, and uh, another dinosaur that's about 30 feet in length all together touching. So there's a real problem in collecting these things to do it, uh, the correct job. But these guys did a fantastic job of collecting. They took it out in, in, in very large blocks. Now that's the best way to get it out of the field fast and to maintain that context. The way these fossils are found in the ground, the, the fossils that are collected with them are right there in the same jackets. You can do some uh, really fantastic uh, detective work with these fossils because that taphonomy is still preserved. We have, have the, the context of, of, of what happened to those animals immediately upon burial. One of the interesting things, of the many interesting things of the, of the dueling dinosaurs, is both skeletons, both the ceratopsian and the theropod, are complete from the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail. There is a bit of frill missing from the ceratopsian, but there are pieces of frill that were picked up uh, prior to the excavation. Um, uh, you know, the, finding dinosaurs that are this complete is really unheard of. Uh, just, it just does not happen. So here we have two, literally the two most complete dinosaurs from the Hell Creek Formation, and here they are together. Just unbelievable and completely articulated. When we look at these two dinosaurs, we see something that's pretty rare in the fossil record. It appears, and I think there's really good evidence to support, it appears that these dinosaurs actually killed each other. They certainly died together and were buried together. Chris Morrow was prepping the skeletons. He found a couple of patches, and I'm sure there's a lot more, of skin on the ceratopsian. Uh, this ceratopsian skin matches very well in other chasmosaurian uh, ceratopsians. This is, 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 is very exciting. Um, but in addition to that, there appears to be skin with the nano tyrannus. Now we know from Tyrannosaurus rex and one specimen that we excavated a few years ago called Wyrex that there are, were a few small, very small, minuscule patches of skin. Um, this seems to have a very tight pattern of skin also. Uh, uh, I think it's going to match pretty well, but uh, further preparation is going to really help with our understanding of what that skin looks like and see if it changes over the body. But I think there, we're going to find there's quite a bit of skin associated with both skeletons. Now that is important because we can see what the outside of that animal looked like. For the, really for the first time be able to have a much better understanding of the surface of that dinosaur. There are only two large ceratopsians known from the Hell Creek Formation. And this ceratopsian is as big or bigger than any of the ones known. There is Triceratops and Taurosaurus. Uh, these have both been found in incomplete skeletons. The most complete Triceratops skeleton is about 50% complete. Here we have one that's nearly 100% complete. Uh, this Ceratopsian skeleton, however, is not Triceratops. It's something different. And I say that, first of all, because its ischium, which one is, the, is one of the pelvic bones, is absolutely straight. Now that's important because all Ceratopsians, and even Protoceratopsids, the beginning of Ceratopsians, have a curved ischium. This has two straight ischia. Something's going on. It's not the same thing. Also, to add to that, the, the skull appears to have never had horns. So you have this seven foot long skull, more than two meter long skull, with no horns. It's something new. It's a new genus and species of Ceratopsian. Also, interestingly enough, the theropod. The theropod, and this, from someone who studies tyrannosaurs, this is one of the most fantastic things about this specimen. That theropod has a skull whose characters match Nanotyrannus. Nanotyrannus was first described in 1985 by Robert Bacher, Mike Williams, and Philip Curry. It was a redescription of a skull described in 1946 as Gorgosaurus lancensis, so it's Nanotyrannus lancensis. This has been in dispute since 1999 uh, when Thomas Carr, through some very, very good reasoning, uh, thought that 
Nanotyrannus actually represents an individual, a young individual, an immature individual of Tyrannosaurus rex. So it's an on, part of the ontogenetic series or the growth series of Tyrannosaurus rex. And there's been this big argument since 1999 uh, with, with, with two different factions, one supporting Bakker's uh, assertion that this is a, a, a valid genus and one supporting Carr's position that this is in fact a juvenile T. rex. This specimen answers that question. Clayton and his team and the landowners uh, will make the site available so we can do a really thorough taphonomic study of this site. Um, when we visited the site in, in December two years ago, uh, we were able to see some very unusual structures in this big massive sandstone unit. And uh, uh, you know, it, it, to try to understand, here are these dinosaurs preserved in such three dimensions. Um, if you look at uh, the three-dimensional model that was made of these, of these skeletons, you can see how it flows and, and, and there's something going on here. How, you know, these were buried almost instantaneously, well, instantaneously geologically, you know, within a few days of their death. And, and, and it has to be some very special circumstances that cause this. Wherever these specimens end up, there needs to be a really concerted effort into doing the best preparation possible. Number one, they should remain in context. They should not be taken out of the matrix except for certain examples. For instance, we might want to take out one of the nano, the nano tyrannus's arms. Uh, we want to take out the skull probably to CT scan it. We hopefully will be able to CT scan these larger blocks. We want to maybe minimize their size so that they would fit in into some of the uh, uh, industrial uh, CT scanners that are available. Um, we, we also want to, uh, now this will help us look internally at these, at these bones. Um, we also want to make sure that the specimens remain in matrix. That's very, very important. It's the only way to preserve that skin. You can't take the bones out and expect to preserve the skin also. Um, I think that uh, uh, the, the ceratopsian, which was, had the most weathering to one side, there's some, uh, some of the ribs are broken and it's, it's, it's lost some of the skin because it was so near the surface and the roots kind of uh, did some damage to the skin. The bones are still in good shape, but the skin is, is kind of not there on the uh, one side. Is we might want to uh, elevate that specimen enough where we can prepare both sides so you can see bones on one side and hopefully skin on the other. Um, uh, uh, we're going to, in fact, uh, very soon turn that skull over of the ceratopsian so we can really get a good view of what that skull looks like. Because we still don't know. We see the underside of the skull and, and kind of part of uh, one side of the face. But we don't see what that frill looks like. We don't see what, uh, what sort of boss we have instead of a horn or what's going on with the top of the head. So uh, whatever preparation scheme is worked out for this. It has to be looked at very carefully before anything more is done to this specimen to make sure we preserve everything possible with this, because this is one of the most exciting dinosaur discoveries that's ever been made. We are currently looking for a museum that will become the permanent home of these, of, of these specimens. And and uh, it is important to us that that, that that home will be a research center or will allow the research by other paleontologists. And so that access to these specimens will be available. I also think that there's this specimen uh, of the, this, this case where you have these two dinosaurs that probably killed each other would make the most fantastic exhibit in any museum. It would become basically a cornerstone for that museum. So any museum that is lucky enough to get these specimens is going to be, it, it will be really the focus of any paleontological exhibit they could imagine. And, and I, can, I can just see the you know, visitors pouring in my droves to see this. I know I'd go many, many times. <laughs>